Welcome to Lecture 3.7, Conjugacy Classes. So as an overview, recall that for any fixed subgroup of G, the conjugate subgroup of H by a fixed group element is denoted like this, GH, G inverse, and is the set of all products of the form G something in H times G inverse. Additionally, H is normal if every conjugate of that subgroup is equal to itself. Here's a slight variation of this theme. So we can fix the element that we are conjugating instead of the subgroup. So given a fixed element x and g, we may ask which elements in our group can be written as g x g inverse for some g. So which elements are a conjugate of x? This may remind you of matrices when we ask about similar matrices. Which matrices can be written as, I don't know, P, A, P inverse? So you may ask that question. So the set of all such elements in G is called the consciousy class of X and denoted like this. Usually we say the consciousy class of X in G, although we may just omit the G if it's understood. Formally, this is the following set. The conjugacy class of X in G is the set of all products of the form G, X, G inverse, where G, little g ranges throughout our group. Here are some remarks. In any group, the conjugacy class of the identity is just the identity. Because no matter what you conjugate the identity by, the G and the G inverse will cancel and you get back the identity. Second, if x and g commute, then if you conjugate x by g, you can swap the order of x and g, and the g and g inverse cancels, and you get back x itself. Thus, when computing the conjugacy class of x, we only need to test g, x, g inverse for those g that do not commute with x. Moreover, the conjugacy class of an element is just itself if and only if x commutes with everything in g. You see why that is true? So if, if x commutes with everything in g, then every product like this, you can pull x to the front and cancel the g inverses. And conversely, if there's something else in the consciousy class besides x, let's say that's g, then x and g cannot commute. Here's a quick but important lemma. Conjugacy is an equivalence relation. That means that it is reflexive because every x is conjugate to itself. And to see that, just conjugate it by the identity. So x is in the same conjugacy class as itself. It's symmetric because if I can conjugate x to get y, like this, then I can conjugate y to get x like that. So notice that if I multiply both sides of this equation here, on the left by g inverse, and on the right by g, then I get that equation. So if x is conjugate to y, y is conjugate to x. And finally, the third condition in the equivalence relation is transitivity. So if x is conjugate to y, and y is conjugate to z, then x is conjugate to z. And it's not hard to check that at this hold. And, it, and if you want to write this out, you can see x equals g h z h inverse g inverse. Remember, you have to swap the order of these things when taking the inverse. And notice that this thing here is equal to y. So y g g inverse. And that's equal to x. So yes, x is conjugate to z. 
Since conjugacy is an equivalence relation, it partitions the group G into equivalence classes, and we call these conjugacy classes. Now this happens not just for conjugacy classes, but for any equivalence relation. Anytime you have an equivalence relation on a set, let's call that set G for a group, then the equivalence classes partition the set. And why is that? Well, just take your favorite element, let's call it X, and say, what things are you equivalent to? And that's going to be some subset. Take something that's not in that subset, call it Y, and say, what things are you equivalent to? And that's going to be some other subset. And you can keep doing that, and that will partition your entire group, because every element has to be in its in some equivalence class. And now everything in the same equivalence class, you can think of them as families. You can say x is related to x prime. Well, obviously, x is related to itself. x prime has to be related to x. And if x is related to x prime, and x prime is related to x double prime, then x has to be related to x double prime. OK, so let's do an explicit example. Let's compute the conjugacy classes in the group D4. And we'll start by finding the conjugacy class of R. Now recall that we only need to compute this product for those elements that do not commute with R. So in particular, we can skip the identity, we can skip R squared, and we can skip R cubed. This is what we get when we conjugate R by the other four elements in D4, those that do not commute with it. That is F, RF, R squared F, and R cubed F. These are the reflections. And in all three of these cases, I'll let you check the details if you want, we get R cubed. Therefore, the conjugacy class of R contains R, it always contains itself, and R cubed. So these four elements, we conjugate R by it, we get R cubed. And the other four elements, those that do commute with R, obviously when we conjugate R by them, we get back R. So the conjugacy class has two elements. Since conjugacy is an equivalence relation, then the conjugacy class of R cubed is equal to the conjugacy class of R. And both of these, of course, are R and R cubed. So to compute the conjugacy class of F, we don't need to check the four elements that commute with F, namely E, R squared, F, and R squared, F. For the other four elements, if we conjugate F by them, namely R, R cubed F, Rf and R cubed F. I'll let you check the details if you want to, but for all four of those, we get R squared F. Therefore, the conjugacy class of F in D4 consists of these two elements. And of course, because it's an equivalence relation, that's also the conjugacy class of R squared F in D4. What do you think the consciousness class of RF is? And I claim that we can figure it out without actually computing a bunch of conjugates like we did up here. So note that it has to have size greater than 1 because RF does not commute with everything in D4. It also cannot contain elements from the other conjugacy classes that we've already computed, things like this, because the conjugacy classes partition. The only element left that we have not used up is R cubed F. So the conjugacy class of RF has to contain these two elements. And here's a picture of the conjugacy classes right here, something that we call the class equation. And let me go over it. 
So we started with computing the contingency class of R, and we got that it was these two elements. Next, we took F and we computed its contingency class. We got these two elements. Now, we didn't actually compute the contingency classes of the identity, because or of R squared, but those two elements commute with everything in D4. So therefore, their contingency classes we know have size 1. So at this point, when we were looking at the contingency class of RF, we only had two elements left, these two right here. And we knew that the class containing RF had to have at least two elements, so we had no other choice. It had to be both of these things. So with this picture, you can see that we can write D4 as a union of its contingency classes. And we can do this with any group. So D4 is this union of these five contingency classes. And the ones that have size 1 are precisely the ones that commute with everything in D4. So we call this decomposition the class equation. Or technically the class equation is something slightly different but very similar to this. And we will look at that in the next slide. Let's start with the definition. Not something we need, but something which is really convenient to have a term for. The center of a group G is the set denoted Z of G. And the Z is there because it comes from German. Centrum starts with the Z. And it's the set of all group elements that commute with everything in the group. A quick observation using this terminology is that the contingency class of an element is itself if and only if that element is in the center of the group. So let's prove it formally. Though I think we've already argued through why this is true. Normally, for an if and only if proof like this, we have to assume that A holds and then prove B, and then we have to assume that B holds and prove A. However, for this one, because it's so short and simple, we will assume that A holds, and we will show that through a series of implications why B holds, except those series of implications are going to be if and only if implications. So suppose x is in its own consciousness class. That means that the consciousness class has size 1, or equivalently, so if and only if, every conjugate of x equals x. Equivalently, multiplying the right-hand side of this equation by g, right-hand side of both sides of this equation by g, that means that gx equals xg for all elements in g. And again, that's an if and only if statement. And that holds if and only if x is in the center. And that's the end of the proof. At last, here is the class equation as it is traditionally presented. For any finite group g, the order, the size of g, is the size of the center plus the sizes of all the consciousy classes that are bigger than 1. So we've essentially proven this. And here's, here's a picture for why this is true based on what we know. And let's just go back to that example of D4 when we had these two elements in the center and then we had we had these other consciousness classes R and R cubed F and R squared F and then RF and R cubed F so the class equation just says that the number of elements in this group is the size of the center which we know is just the union of these size 1 consciousness classes plus the size of the elements in all of the other consciousness classes. So in other words, eight elements equals two elements in the center 
plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. And this just follows from the fact that consciousness is an equivalence relation. Let's now prove some more results on consciousness classes. Every normal subgroup is the union of consciousness classes. So that means if one element is contained in a normal subgroup, all of its conjugates are as well. And I don't have much space for the proof, so that should suggest that it's quite short. Let's take an element n in a normal subgroup of G. Then any conjugate of n is trivially inside the conjugate of the corresponding subgroup. And because n is normal, that is equal to n. Thus, if n is in a normal subgroup, its entire conjugacy class is contained in N as well. Next proposition. Conjugate elements have the same order. Remember that the order is the number of times that you need to multiply an element to get back to the identity. And it's infinite if there is no such integer. So to prove this, let's take two elements, X and Y, that happen to be conjugate and say they're conjugate by G. Let's now suppose that x to the n is equal to the identity. And let's consider y to the n. So y to the n is g x g inverse to the n, which we can write out like that. And now notice that each consecutive g inverse g is going to cancel here, leaving g x to the n, g inverse, and x to the n is the identity, so the g's cancel and we get the identity. So this says that if x to the n is equal to the identity, then y to the n is the identity as well. And thus we can conclude, therefore, the order of x is at least the order of y. Now, we can't right away claim equality just yet, but let me explain why this is true. So, let's assume that x has finite order, and let's let n be the order of x. So, if, if x to the n is the identity for the n, which is the order of x, then we conclude that y to the n is the identity as well. But we don't necessarily know that that's the minimum power to raise y2 to, to get the identity. It's like how an element with order 2, if you raise it to the 10th power, you will get the identity, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your element has order 10. So we can conclude only this. So how do you conclude the opposite implication, or the, the opposite inequality, that your order of y is greater than or equal to the order of x? Well, one way to do it is just reverse the roles of x and y. And so, in other words, consider y and g inverse x, g, which is x, and then run through the same argument, and you get the opposite inequality, and you're done. That will work. But let me show you another way that's just about as easy. Let's suppose that conversely y to the n is the identity for some integer n. Then, well, y to the n, if you write it out like this, reduces down to g x to the n g inverse, which is the identity. And therefore, if you multiply on the left by g inverse and on the right by g of both sides of this equation, it must follow that x to the n is the identity. And if x to the n is the identity, that doesn't mean that the order of x is n. It means that the order of x is at most n. Because again, think of the example of the element of order 2. You raise it to the 10th power, you get the identity. 
So this means that the order of x is less than or equal to the order of y, because we can assume that we're taking n to be the order. Now, technically, I have only considered the case when x and y have finite order, but it's pretty simple to show that if one of these things has infinite order, the other one must as well. It's time for another example. So let's determine the consciousness classes of D6. And here's the presentation generated by R and F, with R to the sixth being the identity, F squared being the identity. And this relation is written perhaps slightly differently than we're used to. So remember what usually happens is we have R F equals F R to the in general, n minus, minus 1. Well, what that means, so let's not write it like this. Let's write that as rf equals f r to the fifth. r squared f equals f r to the fourth. r cubed f equals f r cubed. r to the fourth f equals f r squared. And then r to the fifth f equals f r to the first. And now notice that these things here I could write as this is f r inverse. And this is f r minus 2. This is f r to the minus 3 and so forth. F r to the minus 4 and f r to the minus 5. Because rotating 5 times clockwise is the same as rotating 1 time counterclockwise. And in general, rotating i times clockwise is the same as rotating negative i times counterclockwise. So this relation might be a little bit different, but I want to convince you that that is exactly what we're used to, i.e. it is a concise way to write this or this right here. And we're writing it this way because it's going to be useful for our computations. Now the center of D6 consists of the elements E and R cubed. Remember, R cubed is in the center because R cubed F equals F R cubed by this relation. So R cubed commutes with not only R, but also with F, and therefore with all elements involving R and F. Next, the only two elements of order 6 are R and R to the fifth. Now we know that R does not commute with everything, i.e. R is not in the center. So the conjugacy class of R must have at least two elements, and all elements in this consciousness class have the same order. So the only other possibilities, the only other possibility singular is that R and R to the fifth must be in their own consciousness class. So we can conclude this right away. Similarly, there are only two elements in D6 of order three. That is R squared and r to the fourth. These are the rotations by 120 and 140 degrees. These things are not in the center of the group. Therefore, they must be in a consciousness class of size at least two, consisting of all elements, or not all, consisting of elements of order three. But there's only two of them. So the consciousness class of r2, or r squared, must be exactly these two elements. Now comes the slightly harder part. Let's compute the consciousness class of a reflection. This is an element of order two. R to the i, f. And we need to consider two cases. Conjugating by a rotation or conjugating by a reflection. In the first case, we conjugate r to the i f by 
R to the J. Now I've highlighted these two elements in red because I can swap their order. And this is where I use that very useful relation up here. F R to the J is just, sorry, F R to the minus J is just R to the J F. And then we can combine exponents and write this as R to the I plus 2J times F. Second case now, if I conjugate r to the i f by a reflection, r to the j f, then, now let's write this out in reverse order with inverses. I don't need an inverse for f because f inverse is itself. I've highlighted these in red. These things cancel. And I'm left with r to the j f r to the i minus j and I can move the R onto the other side of the F if I swap the sign of the exponent. So I get this right here. And when I combined exponents, I get R to the 2J minus I times F. So what can we say about this? Well, I claim that R to the IF and R to the JF are conjugate if and only if i and k are both even or both odd. And think about why that is. So I started with r to the i f, and I can get to r to the some other exponent times f for any even number 2j. And same thing down here, I, if I conjugate by reflection, I can conjugate r to the i f to get r to the something else, but that exponent has the same parity. So these things are conjugate if i and k are both even or both odd. Here is a picture of what we just determined. It's the consciousness classes of D6. So there are two elements in the center that can be with everything, E and R cubed. Those are in size one conjugacy classes. This is the conjugacy class containing R and R to the fifth of the rotations of order six. Here's the conjugacy class of the rotations of order three. And then the six reflections are partitioned into two consciousness classes. One of them has even exponents, and one of them has odd exponents. And remember that the class equation just says that these 12 elements are partitioned or counted by the two elements in the center plus the sizes of the consciousness class. So 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 3 plus 3 equals 6. One of the big conceptual ideas that I want to impress upon you in this lecture is the fact that consciousness preserves structure. Now, what do I mean by that? So think back to linear algebra. This is when you first saw the concept of consciousness, although we called it something else. We said two matrices, A and B, are similar, or they're conjugate in our language, if they are related like this. If A equals P, B, P inverse for some matrix P. And these are square matrices, of course. Now, conjugate matrices have the same eigenvalues, the same eigenvectors, and the same determinant. In fact, they represent the same linear map, but under a change of basis. And this little detail is something that you might not have seen in an undergraduate linear algebra class. But it, it, but it is nonetheless very important. If two matrices are similar, and they actually represent the same linear map, but with respect to a different basis. If n is even, then there are two types of reflections of an n-god. In one type, the axis of reflection goes through two corners, something like this. So in n equals 6, there are three such reflections. And then there are three reflections of the other type when the axis bisects a pair of sides like these three reflections here. 
Now notice how in dn, conjugate reflections have the same type. In the previous example we saw, the conjugate reflections were r f r cubed f and r to the fifth f. That was one conjugacy class. And the other one was r squared f r to the fourth f and r to the sixth f, which is actually just, just f. And I claim that one of these classes represents this type of reflection, and the other one represents this type of reflection. And I'll let you verify that on your own. But also notice that the rotations of the same structure were conjugate. So conjugacy preserves structure. And the two rotations that had order 6 were conjugate. The two rotations that had order 3 were conjugate. And the one rotation that had order 1, the identity, was conjugate with itself. And what else was there? There was the rotation that had order 2. There was only one of those, and that was conjugate with only itself. So given that, do you have a guess about what the conjugacy classes of reflections are in dn when n is odd? And here's a hint. Let's draw an odd n gone. How about n equals 5? What types of reflections are there here? So I claim there is only one type of reflection in this case. Let's see if I can draw these to all go through the common center. That's close enough. And so if your guess was that all of the reflections, all of the n reflections are conjugate when n is odd, you would be correct. They don't break up into two types or two conjugacy classes like they do when n is even. And as I mentioned earlier, conjugate rotations in dn had the same rotating angle, but in the opposite direction, like r to the k and r to the n minus k. And I'll let you think about how this would generalize when you have larger n, like when n is 24 or 12, something that has a lot more divisors. And there might be rotations that have different rotating angles, or in other words, angles that are not negatives of each other, but have the same order. The last thing we will do in this lecture, while keeping with the theme of consciously preserves structure, as we will look at conjugate classes in the symmetric group. And we'll show that conjugate permutations have the same structure, or whatever the heck that means. So to do this, we need a definition. Say two elements in the symmetric group have the same cycle type if, when written as a product of disjoint cycles, there are the same number of length k cycles for each k. For any permutation, we can write the cycle type as a list, C1 up to Cn, where Ci is the number of cycles of length i in the permutation. Let's do some examples. So this element lives in S9, and it has one one cycle, two two cycles, zero three cycles, and zero four cycles. So we write one, one cycle, two, two cycles, no three cycles, and four, four cycles. And technically, if we wanted to write C1 all the way up to Cn, you know, we could write zero, five cycles, zero, six cycles, zero, seven cycles, zero, eight cycles, and zero, nine cycles. Though it's customary to just omit these trailing zeros. Here's another example. This thing lives in S9. It has 0, 1 cycle, 2 cycle, 3, etc., all the way up to 1, 9 cycle. So this is the cycle type of that permutation. Finally, the identity element, we don't usually write out the 1 cycles, although if we want to write out the cycle type, we have to either write them out or acknowledge they are there. That's why I, 
I wrote the one cycle here. This has cycle type nine. There are nine one cycles. And again, I could technically write this as zero all the way up to zero, but we just say it has cycle type nine. Here's the theorem. We won't prove this. The proof is long and messy. It's not really that advanced. It's just cumbersome. Two permutations in Sn are conjugate if and only if they have the same cycle type. The big idea here is that conjugate permutations have the same structure. Such permutations are or can be thought of as the same up to renumbering. So if you are rearranging n objects, I might number them 1 up to n one way, and you might number them 1 up to n a different way. That will give us different permutations, but those permutations really have the same structure. And this is saying even more than that. This is saying if you have two permutations with the same cycle type, then there is a way to renumber them so they are essentially the same, at least structurally, permutation. We'll conclude with an example of this. Consider the following permutations in S6. So G is the transposition, 1, 2. So here, here's our nice picture notation. H is 2, 3. And R is the rotation that sends 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 back to 1. Since G and H have the same cycle type, they are conjugate. Now it's not clear how to produce this element that they're conjugate by, which is right here. Notice that the inverse of this cycle is this. This is just 1 goes to 6, goes to 5, goes to 4, goes to 3, goes to 2. But it's easy to check that this product does equal that. Notice that 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, and 3 goes to 2. So 1 goes to 2, and so on. Here's a visual interpretation of the equality G equals R, H, R inverse. So here I have six positions, and the numbers are fixed. This is position 1, position 2, position 3, and so on. The colors might change. Think of the colors as people who are on these positions, but the numbers do not. So when I apply the transposition 1, 2, then I'm swapping the, these two colors. So yellow moves up to here, and red moves down to here. So I've denoted that with these arrows. These have swapped colors. And I claim that G, 1, 2, is equal to R, H, R inverse. So this is what you get by going R, H, and then R inverse. So let's check this. Let's take these colors and let's rotate them by 2 pi over 6. So 60 degrees clockwise. So the red goes here. So the red goes there. The yellow goes there. So this is what we get when you apply the rotation R. Now, if I want to swap the colors red and yellow, I have to do them in different positions. I have to apply the transposition 2, 3. That swaps these two colors. Okay, so after I've swapped those two, now if I want to rotate them backwards by 60 degrees, then I get back to where I started with. So I get back up here. So to summarize, transposing 1 and 2 right away is the same thing as rotating by 60 degrees, transposing 2 and 3, and then rotating back. So these two transpositions have the same structure, and they are related by conjugation.